What's up guys? My name is Dustin Lang. I'm the online pastor here at New Story Church. I wanna welcome you to our YouTube channel. Here we'll be posting content that inspires you, that challenges you, and most importantly, leads you closer to Jesus. Hope you enjoy. They say the war tore a hole in the sky. Only a few survived. That was 30 winters ago. I have been walking ever since. Our only hope is in my hands. Some would kill to have it. I will kill to protect it. Put that hand on me again, you won't get it back. All right, come on down the hard way. All right, well, welcome to New Story, where this obviously isn't your mama's church. Uh, my name is Tom, and uh, we are, as we wind down with uh, summer, we are also winding down in this series called uh, At the Movies, where basically we're taking a scriptural look at things presented on the silver screen. My name is Tom, and uh, so good to see you guys, especially those of you that are here for the first time. Don't be alarmed. Uh, this has been a great series. Now, I'm curious, has anyone here actually seen uh, the movie, the book of Eli. It's actually on Netflix right now. Some of you saw it live. Okay. All right. A good number of us. All right. Awesome. All right. Uh, not a bad movie. Uh, I've actually enjoyed it. It's kind of a post-apocalyptic uh, movie. It was definitely ahead of its time. And a little spoiler alert here for those who haven't seen the movie. Again, you can watch it on Netflix if you want. Uh, the movie is sort of set in this sort of uh, post-apocalyptic America uh, where this main character, this lone survivor, Eli, uh, played by one of my favorite actors, Denzel Washington, he he walks across this wasteland of America uh, in order to protect a very sacred book that in the movie holds all the treasures and secrets of the world, uh, and it's the solution uh, to the devastation that they find themselves in. And in the, in the movie, it's actually that book is actually a King James version of the Bible. And again, I find it absolutely fascinating that right here, in our very own backyard lies a multi-billion dollar industry that invests so much money and resources to basically retell uh, and, and kind of uh, take these biblical characters and position them in such ways to use their stories, to, uh, to, to actually tell their own stories. And in this case, uh, we're talking about Eli and, and the kind of the figure that it's kind of uh, spooned off of is uh, the greatest Old Testament uh, found in all of scripture, his name is Elijah. Turn to your neighbor and say, Elijah. All right, now, Elijah was the greatest Old Testament prophet there was. I mean, you want to talk about A-listers? Did you know that Elijah, for instance, he never died? He actually never died. Uh, and, and in fact, when he, you know, he, uh, the scripture says that he got carried away in a chariot. Second Kings chapter two says a chariot of fire appeared and carried him off into the heavens. So he actually never died. But then did you know that hundreds of years later, 
This same prophet Elijah actually reappeared on a mountain with Jesus. So just imagine this, right? This is a great prophet, right? He never dies. He reappears hundreds of years later with Jesus. And later on, did you know this? This is fascinating. While Jesus was literally, when he was being crucified, people thought that as Jesus was being crucified, fighting for his life, people thought that Jesus was crying out for Elijah's help. So just think about how, how magnificent the reputation of this Old Testament prophet Elijah must have been that people thought years later when Jesus was being crucified, he was calling for Elijah's help. Yet, you know what the most amazing thing about Elijah is? Nothing that I've shared before, but what I'm about to share right now, and that is in the New Testament book of James, James chapter 5, verse 17. The book of James says that Elijah was a man just like who? Us. Elijah was a man just like us. Say, what? What are you talking about? You just said that Elijah never died. You just said that hundreds of years later, he reappeared on a mountaintop with Jesus. You just said that it seemed like Jesus was calling out for Elijah. Yet he is a man just like any one of us. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're like Elijah. Now, some of you feel like you lied right now. You feel dirty, right? <laughs> so here's the deal. If you have a Bible, turn in your Bibles with me. We're going to camp out in 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to old school, Old Testament today. We're going to hang out in this chapter, 1 Kings chapter 17. And as you do, uh, let me just kind of sort of set the stage here. A lot of you don't even have Bibles to turn to. You're looking at it on your phone. Or maybe you're just zoning out and playing a game. I don't know. But anyways, uh, see, during Elijah's day, the people of God had been subject to 19 consecutive evil kings in a row, spanning over almost 200 years, two centuries, uh, not, not more than two, yeah, two centuries, right, 200 years, right? So uh, just think about it, contextually speaking, just think about it in our uh, day and age, just think about this for a second. America, as we know it, is about, you know, give or take 200 years old, right? Now, despite what you think of our current president, our current commander-in-chief, right, whatever you think about it, this is not a political uh, diatribe or anything like that, but despite whatever you think about him, imagine if, imagine if America, uh, that's uh, uh, just about 200 years old, imagine Imagine if we had not just 19 bad leaders in a row, but imagine if we had 19 evil leaders in a row. Just imagine that, right? 19 evil leaders in a row, because that's exactly where, contextually speaking, Elijah finds himself today in our passage. See, the king at this time, if you read the Bible, it says that the king's name was Ahab, okay? And the Bible says that Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any one of those before him. So in over 200 years, and all these kings, like Ahab, this is the worst king. And plus, I want to add, he was also married to a woman named Jezebel. Okay, does that name ring a bell, right? Jezebel. Jezebel, whether you're a believer or not, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, historians agree that Jezebel was one of the most wicked women in the history of mankind, okay? Now, I don't know whose job it is to figure that out, but I'm glad it's not mine, okay? Just imagine that. This evilest king in 200 years in a line of 19 kings is married to the most wicked woman ever known to mankind, okay? And so with that in mind, notice how Elijah enters the scene. The passage that I'm about to read to you right now, this is the first time Elijah ever appears in the Bible. This is his entrance, okay? He's never mentioned in the Bible before until right now. First Kings chapter 17 verse 1 says this, now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve. So Elijah's saying, hey, 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 listen up here, okay? Put down what you're thinking, put down whatever you're doing. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, listen to what he says next, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. You see what just happened there? That's a grand entrance, all right? 
You talk about making an entrance. Friends, no one else in the Bible, no one else in the Bible makes that kind of an entrance. I mean, even Jesus Christ himself came as a baby, right? Born in a manger, right? Elijah, I say all this to, to make the point to you. You have to understand this. Elijah, he comes onto the scene with much swagger. I mean, I think this is why they had Denzel Washington play him, right? Because you, you got to play the part, right? So Elijah, with that in mind, he says straight up to this diabolical duo, most evil king, most evil woman, he gets right up in their face, gets right up in the grill. And what does he say? You know what? By the power of my God, there's not going to be a single day of rain. You're not even going to have dew on this land until I say so, big guy. So I need you to remember that. Just take that thought, put it in your pocket, put it in the back burner for now, because later on in the message, we're going to go to that. Elijah's the one that says, you're not going to have a single drop of rain because I said so. Okay? Okay. And with that in mind, I mean, you have to understand, these are fighting words, right? You don't just go into a stranger's house. You don't go into a king's palace and declare that on his, those are fighting words, yeah? So clearly this must be where Elijah, whose very name means the Lord is my God. This is surely the moment like where in all classic movies, in all movies, they have that classic fight scene. You know what I'm talking about? Every movie has it, right? That classic fight scene, right? Where, where the music starts pumping, right? Uh, you, 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 get, you get like the, the, the bass starts playing, right? And, and the music starts pumping and, 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 then, and then you get all these jump cuts all over the place, right? And, and, and then you know that this fight is going to about to break out because now you've stood up to each other. But that's only in the movies. See, this is real life. And in real life, God actually tells Elijah, this great prophet, guess what he tells Elijah? He tells Elijah, you know what, Elijah? Guess what? You need to go and hide now. You need to go and hide. Again, not very Hollywood if you ask me, right? But don't take my word for it. Look at the next verse. Verse 2 says this, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here. Get out of here. Turn, turn eastward and what? What's the word there? Hide. Hide in the Kareth Ravine. We'll get back to, back to that in a second. East of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens. I've ordered these birds. I'm going to have these birds give you, like, a, you know, a, deliver you food. Okay? See, see what's happening here? Rather than raise an army to take a stand against the nasty king and his evil empire, God is doing here in this scripture what he often does. He is investing in one person. He wants to raise one person to lead a change. See, sometimes God's just looking for one. Sometimes God's just looking for one. He's not looking for a whole church. He's not looking for a whole county. He's not looking for a whole state. Sometimes God's just looking for one person. And so my question to you this morning is, could you be that one person? Could you be that one person? See, I wonder if maybe today God wants to do something similar in our own lives. Like maybe right here, right now, maybe there's a businessman who needs to take a step of integrity in a world and in an environment where integrity is not honored, where integrity is not rewarded. Uh, God still wants you to take a step of integrity. Or, or maybe this morning, maybe there's a single person who who needs to obey God in the area of sexual purity. Like, despite what the world is saying, and despite whatever your friends are doing, it doesn't even matter, but God wants you, you, that one person. You feel like the whole world is doing something else. You feel like all your friends are doing something else, but God's telling you, no, 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 I want you to stand in sexual purity. See, I just wonder, is there one person here, is there even just one, just one, who hears the whisper of God this morning, and it feels like thunder because there's a holy discontent inside of you because you want something more for your life and you know God has created you for more. Is there just one man, woman, or child in our midst where that could be happening? Because you see, God often raises up one person to make a big difference. He doesn't need a whole army. He often starts with just one but not without a price. 
As a matter of fact, uh, Christian author A.W. Tozer, a lot of you have read his stuff. Uh, he puts it best. He says this, it is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Yeah, take a screenshot of that. Absolutely. It is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Which leads us to our first of two non-negotiables for being used by God in a great way. For those of you taking notes, maybe you're doing it the old school style with pen and paper. Maybe you're doing it on our church app. That's great. I want to encourage you to do this. We're going to talk about two non-negotiables, two non-negotiable points uh, for being used by God in a great way. The first thing, the first point is this. Uh, the first thing that Elijah shows us is if you want to be used by God in a great way, point number one, jot this down, is this. Expect temporary pain. Expect it. Turn to your neighbor and say, expect pain. Expect temporary pain. See, friends, there's just no way around it. The Christian life, this side of the cross, is not absent of pain. I don't know where we got the idea that once we became a Christian, once we start following Jesus, that we're not going to have uh, any pain in our lives. There's pain in parenting. There's pain in finances. There's pain in leading. There's physical pains. There's emotional pains. There's relational pains. There's pains in marriage. There's pains in church. There's pains at work. Jesus himself experienced a life of pain. So why would anyone who calls themselves a Christ follower, a Christian, a, a little Christ, why would anyone that is a disciple of Christ, why would we expect any? Anything less than what Jesus himself endured. In fact, just to prove a point here, I love it when the scriptures does this. When you dig in the scriptures a little bit deeper, I love when this happens in scripture. Even the very name of the place, I said that we would get back to this, even the name of the, uh, of the place that God told Elijah to go to, it was that brook that was called what? The Kareth Ravine, right? It's called the Kareth Ravine. Do you know what it, Kareth Ravine translates to in, in English? In the original Hebrew word, Kareth Ravine, translates to the words cut off. Go ahead and write that down in your notes. Cut off. In other words, don't, don't miss this, okay? Catch this this, God is telling Elijah, the author is getting on his bullhorn and he's making it loud and clear. Attention, Elijah, you've had it pretty good until now, but guess what? I'm taking you to a place. I'm leading you to a place where you will be what? Cut off. You're about to be cut off. It's very clear. God, who has led Elijah and used Elijah powerfully then, is now bringing him to a place where he is going to be cut off. Do you feel cut off this morning by God? See, friends, this is a season of pain. And some of you right now, you're nodding your heads. Your eyes are tearing up. You're looking down because you're in a season of pain. Because you feel like you've been cut off. Because for you today, this isn't just church. This isn't just theological. This isn't just biblical. For you today, this is life. This is where you find yourself. And see, it's like God was saying to Elijah, oh, man, that's so cute. Oh, gosh, that's so cute. You thought standing up to these two bad people was, was all I had for you. Is that what you thought? You thought that was something? Friend, let me tell you, that was nothing. That's nothing compared to how much I have for you. That's nothing compared to how much more I want to use you. But not before we go to training camp. Not, not before we do some triple sessions. Because there in boot camp, you're going to learn how to totally depend on me daily. Because you know something? I won't use you mighty in a public way until I train you privately in a personal way. I ain't going to use you mighty publicly until I start training you privately. That's what God's doing. Not just talking about life. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about your life. 
If you find yourself cut off right now, could it be that God is taking you through a hardcore boot camp right now to work on your inner man, your inner woman privately before he uses you in a mighty way publicly? You see, I get it, friends. It's Labor Day weekend. You thought you were going to get a nice little sermonette for Christian nets today, didn't you? You're like in beach mode. You're in picnic mode. Man, Pastor Tom's going hard today. What's up? That's right. That's right. I can't help what the scripture says. This is not just a nice little sermonette for Christian nets, which makes this next verse so sweet. Check it out. Verse 5 says this. So he did what the Lord had told him. Elijah went there. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread, just like God said they would, and meat, by the way. I mean, this is like Grubhub. It's like delivery service here, right? The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. All right, here's your roast beef sandwich. And he drank from the brook. It's not bad. All right, did you see that? It's the second non-negotiable. If you want to be used by God in a great way, jot this down, number two, you need to quickly obey. Quickly obey. Quickly obey. If you want to be used by God in a great way, just quickly obey. In other words, here's what I'm saying. This is what your pastor on Sunday in church is telling you during a church service. Sometimes you ain't got to pray. Does that make sense? Right? That's right. You heard me. Your pastor just said, sometimes you don't have to pray. See, if you're like me and you've been growing up in church, like, you know all the things to say when, right? So, like, someone asks you to do something. Oh, you know, you got to confront that person, truth spoken in love. Have you thought about apologizing? You know? You, you need to love more. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, thank you. Praise God. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray about that. I'm gonna, let me just get back to me next week. I'm going to pray about that. No! You ain't got to pray about certain things. That's just an excuse. Who are you really fooling? You're not, you're not fooling yourself. You're not fooling that person. You're certainly not fooling God. You don't have to pray about certain things. Just quickly obey. If you know the right thing to do and you're not doing it, that's called sin. Quickly obey. So sometimes you just need to apologize. Some of you, you just need to love. Others of you, you just need to give. Just quickly obey. Die to self. Quickly obey. The, the word of God simply says in verse 5, it says, so he, Elijah, so Elijah did what the Lord had told him. It's like, that's it, it's one sentence. So Elijah did what he told him. I mean, this was a guy who was the greatest Old Testament prophet ever. This is a guy who had so much in front of him and so much behind him, and, and God tells him like this, this nonsensical thing, I'm gonna cut you off, I'm gonna send you to this place, you came from the loftiest of heights, but now you're going to the dirtiest of depths, and you know what? And, and he's like, all right, I'll, I'm gonna go. I'll, I'll do what you tell me, Lord. Quickly, he didn't pray about it. He didn't seek counsel. He didn't go to a small group and ask. So he did what the Lord had told him. And in that process, God was teaching him, just like he can teach you, how to depend on him daily for food, water, all your necessities. So let me ask you here today, friends, where is God asking you to obey him right now? Who's God asking you to obey him right now? Is it in your finances? Is it in saying you're sorry? Is it in, in stopping a, a destructive habit? Is it loving somebody you actually hate? See, friends, because, you know, on my best days, like my best, holiest days, Right? Like when I wake up and I've got a song in my heart, I'm worshiping him, right? 
Uh, you know, when I'm, uh, I, I have my quiet time in the morning. The girls are all behaving. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, uh, like uh, everything's good with me and Erica. Like on my best, best days, I get quick obedience, right? That makes sense. It makes sense. And I can do it, right? But here's, here's where it turns. Here's where it gets a little extra. I'm going to read you a verse, the next verse. And this verse, um, personally speaking, is one of the most frustrating verses for me in the entire scriptures. Okay? The verse that we're about to read, it, it, I, it just it drives me nuts. It drives me nuts. It, 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 check this out. Verse, verse 7, it says this. It says, Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Some of you get it, right? I told you to remember what we talked about earlier, right? Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Are you kidding me right now? Friends, why did the brook dry up? Why is there no rain in the land? Who said that? Elijah did. Elijah did. In other words, friends, let me put it to you this way. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever done anything with the best of intentions and actually had it blow up in your face? Right? You know what I'm talking about? Like you meant well, you meant good, but somehow this thing just blows up in your face and you regret that you even tried. Right? Like for me, just honestly speaking, um, <laughs> in one of my previous churches, we, we had this thing uh, called, like, a, it was a, like, basically it was a pastor's wives retreat, right? So, like, you know, pastors are always going on retreats, staff is always going on retreats, all this stuff. But, like, this was specifically one for, uh, if you were a pastor on this church staff, uh, this was a time dedicated for your wife, uh, to go away for three nights and four days and just be like spiritually fed and basically pampered. Like there was manicures and pedicures and masseuses and just like whatever women like. Like it was all there, right? It's like no kids, no husband, like relaxing time away. And just like oh, some of you are like, you, you want to be there right now. I want to be there right now, right? Like it's just amazing, right? And so anyways, uh, but internally, uh, it was kind of known as hell week uh, on the staff because that was the week where we knew as husbands, right? We knew like, okay, well, all right, we got to just buckle down. Like we got to take care of the kids now. Like, like whoever you were, right? Like you had to take take care of like all the meals. You have to take care of all the cleaning, all the prepping. You have to take care of all like the transporting of kids here and there, like your own household. And some of you are like, please, like there's 365 days. You can't do that for three nights. Like they're your own kids. I, I get that, but just, just bear with me. I'm just being honest with you. I'm just telling you how, what it felt like uh, for, for those of us on staff, right? So anyways, so, so this was approaching, this, this retreat's approaching and I'm just like, okay, all right. I'm going to be a good sport about this. I, I am not going to give even a hint of like I'm nervous or I'm worried or I'm anxious about this Like because I want Erica to go and, and just experience this thing and love it and blah, blah, blah. And she does so much that this is my one opportunity to really serve her and blah, blah, blah. Kid, she, you, you better. And so, you know, and so that, that whole thing, right? And anyways, she goes off and right before she left, uh, I, I wrote her this love letter. Okay, and I wrote her this love letter and it, it appeared on her, like when she checked in and on, on her bed, on her pillow, it appeared right there, right? And so uh, basically, and she wasn't supposed to do this, but she did anyways, um, like you, you, were, you were supposed to cut all contact with the outside world, right? But when she got my letter, it moved her so much that she was just like, oh, oh, this made me, this makes me very happy and I'm going to make you very happy when, when I come home. And I was just like, yes, Lord, yes, I can do this, right? I'm just like, I'm, I'm like thinking, oh, this is good, bomb chicka, wah, wah, whatever, right? And so, like, I, I, like, that gave me extra motivation, right? And so, like, you know, for Thursday night, everything's good. And Friday night, and, and, and everything's good. And, like, just when I'm getting tired and just, like, when things are falling out of control and the kids don't want to eat what I, what I make them or what I buy them and there's more stuff to clean, whatever, whatever, I'm just, I kept thinking of her text and I'm just like, no, I got to do it, I got to I do it. And so, all right. And so like, I'm, I'm doing everything as best as I possibly can. Like the, the house has never been that clean and, and ever before or since actually. The house was so clean. The kids were still alive. They had not missed a single school day, uh, after school lesson, uh, softball practice, nothing. Everything went perfect, right? I just, 
praise God, okay? And then my wife is approaching home, right? It's, it's like the final hours, and like, I'm just like, woo, I'm so, I like, kids, where are you gonna be? Are you going to, you, all right, you going to your friend's house? Are you gonna be over there? Okay, all right, great, great, great. And so like, I'm like, I'm ready, I'm ready, right? Three, four days have gone on, bye, bye, bye. I'm bum chicka wah wah. And so anyways, and so Erica comes, right? She, she comes, and and I don't even know what it was, right? Like three days she was pampered, right? Manicure, pedicure, hair done, like all that stuff, right? The house is clean, kids are gone, like well-fed, still alive, all that stuff. And, 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 and she gets home and I don't even know like what it was, I don't know what I said or didn't say or do or didn't do, but like, 10 minutes, like we hadn't even made it upstairs, like bags are, I can picture this, bags are still in the garage and she's got, and like something happened and we, we got into a fight about something. I can't even remember like what it was about, you know what I mean? Like that's all, like if you've been married a while, like it's always about like something stupid. I don't even know what it was. It was like the smallest, stupidest thing. And like we got into a fight and like this fight just kept on like, Escalating, I, I, and I was just like, "But look at the house; it's so clean." And like, is this this? No bum chikawawa, you know. <laughs> totally blew up in my face. Right? This was not exactly the way that it was supposed to go. And the same thing happens with God. Sometimes the same exact thing happens. You obey God, you're supposed to get blessed, right? Isn't that how it works? It's a transaction, right? Quick obedience, I should get quick blessings, right? If I obey, then, then you give me something good, right? Something good happens to me, right? Wrong. Absolutely wrong. I don't know where you got that thinking, but that's not biblical. Welcome to the world of Elijah. A man just like who? us. This is why he's a man just like us, one of the reasons. And you know what? God, God in his grace is not finished. Because look at verse 8. It says, then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once. Now I'm, he's asking him to move somewhere else. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon. Zarephath of Sidon was this outside country. It was outside the, the, the God's country. Okay, it's this foreign place. Uh, go to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I'm going to relocate you. And I've commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. You need to understand that widows in that, those days, they were, they were social pariahs. They were outcasts, okay? For better or for worse, they were, a widow was someone that was considered cursed by God. A widow, if, your husband, if, you're, if you're a lady and your husband dies, well, back in those days, your husband was the only source of provision and covering and protection uh, that you had. And so when God takes away your only source of provision, covering, and protection, what that, what that communicated to the outside world, for better or for worse, was that, well, God has left you. God has taken his hand off of you. And so therefore, you didn't want to really associate with an outcast like that. That's what a widow was. But listen to what's happening here. Remember the context. God is now taking Elijah, who's in this dry and barren land, this, this brook that dried up. And now he's saying, no, listen, and now I want you to go even to a worse place. I want you to go outside of God's country to Zarephath of Zidon. And I want you to associate with a, a social outcast. People are going to judge you. I want you to associate with this widow. Okay. And stay there, because I've commanded this person in that place to supply you with food. And then here's that quick obedience again. But God, uh, what about this? And what about that? Did he do that? No, 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 no. Verse 10 just says, so he went. There's that quick obedience again. So he went to Zarephath. And, and when he came to the town gate, just like God said, a widow was there gathering sticks. Now, I love this part. It says, he, he called to her and asked, um, Hey, I know we haven't met, uh, but this is kind of awkward. Uh, would, you, would you be able to give me a little bit of water in a jar so that I can have a drink? I'm kind of thirsty. I'm dehydrating. You know, I was at a place. It was a dry place. Brook kind of dried up. I'm a little thirsty right now, right? Verse 11 says, as she was going to get, so she humored him. Never met this guy before. 
Oh, all right, okay. As, as she was going to get it, he called out. Now imagine the audacity here. He called out, oh, and uh, can, you, uh, bring me, uh, can you bring me some bread? Right? Can you, can you bring me a little piece of bread? Um, some toast, please. A little bit of marmalade. Right? It's crazy. Right? As, and then watch this. Watch what happens next. Verse 12. As surely as the Lord your God lives. In other words, again, he's in Zarephath of Zidon, a place that's outside of God's country. Right? So this woman, she doesn't believe in God. There is no God there, right? And so she's saying, well, what does it say? Look here, champ. As surely as the Lord your God lives, I ain't got no bread, okay? I don't know why I broke out into a Jersey accent, but that's, she was from Jersey, okay? I ain't got no bread, all right? In fact, all I got is a handful of flour in a jar, a little bit of oil in a jug, let me tell you what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to gather this stuff, all right, and a few sticks. I'm going to take it home. I'm going to make a meal for myself and my son, not my husband, by the way, because I'm a widow. I'm going to make a little meal for myself and my son so that we can eat it and what? So that we can eat it and die. I'm going to make myself and my boy a last meal, all right? That's who you came up against right now. I'm on my last meal, champ. You're asking me for water. I was going to do that. Now you're asking me for bread? Let me tell you about my life. I got a little bit of flour. I got some sticks. God has left me. And I'm about to die. Awkward. And the only thing that could make this dour situation even worse actually happens. In, in verse 17, it says, uh, sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped Breathing. See, this poor widow's son died. Her past was haunted with the death of her husband. Her future is now maligned with the death of her son. She says to this holy man, this great prophet, what you got against me? Rolling up in here, oh man of God. I didn't bother you. I didn't ask you to come here. What you got against me? Are you serious right now? You playing with me? I don't have anything. I don't have anything. I didn't ask you in here. You're coming. You're asking for everything. I don't know you. You don't know me. What you got against me, man of God? Do you, do you actually come here to remind me of my sin? You going to preach at me? That's what you want? You want to preach at me? You want to convert me? You came here to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Friends, things have gone from like really bad to worse. And Elijah, he didn't ask for any of this, right? I mean, who made the brook dry up in the first place? God. Who told Elijah to go to this poor widow? God. Who told Elijah to ask this poor widow for well, things like God. Who holds life and death in her hands? God. Yet, who finds himself in his deep ditch harming himself and others? Elijah. And so, it's no wonder that there's desperation in his voice. When you read the next verse, verse 20 says this. Then he cried out to the Lord. I mean, he cried out to the Lord. Imagine the situation. Imagine if this were you. Oh, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also 
As if the tragedy you brought me wasn't bad enough, but have you also brought tragedy upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, oh Lord my God, oh Lord my God, oh Lord my God, please let this boy's life return to him, oh Lord my God. Have you ever felt this way? Have you ever felt like something just blew up in your face? Have you ever felt like, God, what are you doing right now? Like, are you for real, God? Why would you allow this to happen? Why would you put me in this situation? Why why did you do this? I've heard good things about you, God. I've heard that you're good, that you're all powerful, that you're all loving, but I don't see any goodness. I don't see any power. I don't see any love here. And I'm in the middle of it, and now this person's blaming me, and I have their blood on my hands. Have you ever felt like this? Have you ever felt cut off? from God? Have you ever felt like, I don't know why you put me in this spot, God. I didn't ask for this. I don't think I deserve it. Like, yeah, I know I'm sinful and everything, but my goodness. Friends, what do you do? What do you do when your life dries up? And the only one who can deliver you from the dry brook is the one who brought you there in the first place. What do you do when your brook dries up? What do you do when God is the one who leads you to dryness? See, that brook, once upon a time, it was overflowing, it was bountiful. And he had Grubhub, he had a food delivered. But now that thing dried up and God brought him to an even worse place, an even more dire situation. See, maybe, maybe some of you ladies in here, maybe, uh, maybe your story is like years ago you married your dream guy. I mean, you, you, you had been praying about this man uh, since you were a little girl, it was your dream. And he came like a knight in shining armor and like swept you off your feet. And for a while it was good. The brook was, was overflowing. And there were many blessings. But today, that marriage, if you can call it that, it, it's, it's so dry. Or maybe, maybe you're, you're a business person and your career was going like up and to the right. Everything was expanding, growing, very lucrative, buying things now. And then for reasons still unknown, just the market tanked or you got laid off or whatever, whatever happened. And, and, and you, it's dry. See, we all have areas in our lives where God leads us to a brook that was once amazing and overflowing with blessings. Plenty to eat, plenty to drink. But then somehow, some way, everything changed. And that once bountiful brook is now dried up. What is that for you? What is that for you? Friends, when you walked in here this morning, uh, you should have received one of these, right? I know somebody said it's a dime bag. It's not a dime bag, okay? Just come on. Come on, people. It's not, it's okay. Uh, It's a little bag, (laughs) okay? It's a little bag. It's got some sand in it. Represents dryness. Represents the dried up brook. If you don't have this in your hands right now, go ahead and raise your hand. We got some ushers and they will come in. We got a lady right over here. If we can get right over here, okay, a couple over there. Raise your hand nice and keep them high until you get one, okay? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to go ahead 
and take out that piece of paper, okay? So everyone right now, and if it gets messy, don't worry about it. We'll clean up after. Life gets messy sometimes, okay? Life gets messy. All right, take out that piece of paper. Take out a writing implement, or if you can borrow someone after they're done, just, just be polite. Just use some co common courtesy here, okay? And here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down one word or one name or one situation or, or one thing that you're going through. One what, that was once a bountiful brook that was once overflowing and was, it was a, a, a source of blessing that today, for whatever reason, you don't have to know the reason, but today it's, it's dried up. It's, that's, that's what this bag symbolizes. It's dried up, okay? So I want you to write down that one thing for you that, that, that this represents, that one place, right? Where has your brook dried up? And here's the thing, okay? I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna ask for this. You're not gonna pass this to anyone. You're not gonna give this to anyone. You're not gonna share this with anyone. You, you're, this is a moment between you and God okay, where you are identifying where has your brook dried up, okay? So I'm gonna give you about 20, 30 seconds to do that right now, okay? This is your moment between you and God. Heavenly Father, um, every single person here that identified a dried brook, a place that was once a source of blessing in life that is today for reasons unknown, just so dried up, Lord, uh, we come to you now and like we literally offer you our dried brook. Lord, if it's, if it's our marriage, if it's our health, if it's our finances, if it's our parenting, if it's a relationship with a friend, if it's our business, if it's life itself, like once we had purpose and, and we were spiritually uh, living a life of vitality, but today, uh, spiritually, we feel dry. Lord, we want to acknowledge this. We admit this before you. And we acknowledge by faith, you have not abandoned us. And so we will not abandon you in this dried place. We acknowledge today that through the power of the word, we see that God, you use even these things. In fact, you use these things mightily. And so, Lord, we pray, I pray right now, that you would, for every man, woman, and child that has identified a dry brook, that you would meet them in that place. And that you would not just restore, but that you would accelerate their path, that you would accelerate their life, and that you would use them even more mightily than you had in days past. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed it, would you give us a like? Also, would you hit the subscribe and the notification buttons? And then you'll be notified about all future content that we post here. Also, if you wanna get involved with our community, please fill out a connect card and one of our pastors will be sure to follow up with you. Thank you so much for checking out this channel. God bless you.